good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for inviting me to speak today. As Andrew said at the beginning um, when he introduced us and himself, it's actually very refreshing to be talking about something other than the UK and the US um, and to really delve into the, the breadth of activity that's happening in Latin America at the moment. I'm going to talk about three countries in particular. I'm going to talk about Mexico, Argentina and Brazil to share with you some research trends from the data that we hold uh, to talk about the varying levels of open access activity in those countries, much of which is focused on the development of repositories. And I'll also talk about some comparisons uh, between all three countries and some pan-Latin American initiatives in the open access space. So first of all, turning to Mexico, I should make clear that these figures are our estimates. Um, but, and to put, put them into context, this is a graph here obviously on expenditure on research and development. Looking at Mexico's GDP, uh, GDP is just over $1.5 trillion, probably closer to the $1.6 trillion mark. Uh, and as a benchmark, the UK's GDP is $2 trillion. And you'll see here that there's been a, a gradual increase in the amount that Mexico has been spending on R&D uh, since 2009. And we've got some estimates here for figures going up to 2015. This does also include private investment on R&D, but the uptick, I think, in 2012 uh, in particular can be explained by the new president that's been sworn in in Mexico. And he's really made it his priority to increase R&D investment. He's actually said that he wants to increase R&D spend to 1% of GDP by the end of his six-year term. And to, to make good on that promise, in the, the 2014 budget was increased by 12% across the piece. And there's also a number of different uh, initiatives that the president's working on in Mexico to increase R&D activity and spend there. So we've got an, in, an increase in R&D spend, but what does that look like in terms of article output? And you'll see here that the number of publications uh, by authors in Mexico has grown in line with an increase in R&D spend, although the red line that dips on the top graph is indicative of the fact that that rate of growth has slowed in recent years, but nevertheless still a trend of increasing article output. And between 2009 and 2013, 83,500 papers were published by authors in Mexico. But when we look at the graph over here, just at the bottom on the citation impact of Mexican authored research, you'll see that very little has changed. There's been an increase in investment, an increase in the number of articles that are published, but very little change in the impact of Mexican authored research. And crucially, certainly from Mexico's perspective, as you would expect, uh, globally, being below that one mark in terms of the citation impact of research is, is quite a, a concern of, for, for Mexico as a whole and as a trend in, a, across Latin America. So how is this feeding into open access developments in Mexico? Well, I think Mexico is similar and, and indicative of what's happening across Latin America. The notion, in particular, looking at the impact of research being quite low, and I'll show you figures for Argentina and Mexico shortly, um, the idea that open access is, is really a way of increasing the visibility and impact of research. Uh, there is a perception that the US and the UK in particular is a closed shop when it comes to Latin American research, and I'll, I'll leave that for you to judge whether it's the case, but just to give you an example of Elsevier, given the amount of activity in Latin America, we've only been based there for the last seven years. So that gives you perhaps a sense of where that feeling's coming from in Latin America. There's also, uh, across Latin America, for want of a, a much better word, a leftist view of research and education, the notion that education and research is a public good, similar to the way in which we see uh, discussions in the UK about taxpayer funding for, for research, the notion that if money's gone into that research, it should be free. So specifically looking at open access, in, access initiatives in Mexico, uh, Mexico recently passed in May the bill to reform and add to the science and technology law, general education law, and the organic law of the National Council for Science and Technology, which is probably one, one of the longest uh, bill names that I've ever seen. Um, but just to go through what, what this bill is designed to do, it sets out that for Mexico to strengthen its scientific, technological, and innovation sectors, it should promote universal access to scientific and technological information. And that includes databases that have bibliographic information. It obviously includes journal articles, thesis, dissertations, protocols, patents, and others. 
although interestingly, books is not explicitly listed there, and we assume that books are out of scope, but that is something that we are clarifying with the uh, ministry at the moment to find out whether the open access law applies to books. It's a focus on green open access, so the policy aim is to be achieved through optional deposit of research, and the language is very clear that that deposit is optional. And there's also provisions regarding intellectual property and copyright for that to be respected. And there's reference to embargo periods. And just to give you some background, when the uh, bill was first introduced, it had an immediate deposit requirement and no scope for any embargo periods. But it was only later on when universities, funding agencies, the scientific advisor to the president really got a bit more engaged with the bill that this notion of a, a variable embargo uh, per journal being respected. Uh, the way in which the National Repository Network is to be established and set up is through the National Council for Science and Technology, CONACYT. It will use part of its 1.5 billion euro budget to create this national repository. And in addition to this, there'll also be individual institutional repositories, and the aim is for those to link up to a national repository. As I mentioned, the uh, bill passed in 2014, but we're in a period now uh, called a regulation period where the details of the bill are, are being worked through. And that includes things like which version of, of the article is, is under, the voluntary, um, uh, under the voluntary deposit part of the bill. The language looks like it's the accepted manuscript, but again, things like that we're getting clarity on. So moving on now to Argentina, we can see, as with Mexico, uh, a clear trend on increase in expenditure on R&D. Um, nevertheless, and starting from a, a higher base in question, Mexico spend is obviously, you saw it was up, up to the $7 uh, billion mark versus Argentina's, which is close to $4 billion. Uh, but again, increase in R&D spend. But of course, much like with Mexico, we can see very similar pattern. An increase in article output, a decline in recent years, and even for Argentina, the case is they've had negative growth uh, between 2012 and 2013. And when I was talking to colleagues to try and get a sense of why they thought that actually not only had the rate of growth slowed uh, for Argentina, it had gone backwards, we couldn't really come up with any explanation other than the obvious economic reasons. But if anybody in the audience has any insight into why Argentina in particular has had negative growth over the last year, I'd be very interested to hear it. Uh, but the same trends, increase in R&D spend, increase in article output. In fact, scholarly output increased by, excuse me, 18% between 2009 and 2013, uh, and 55,000 articles were published by authors in Argentina over this period. And you'll see at the bottom graph here, which is interesting, because although um, Argentina spends less on uh, research than Mexico, it's, the impact of that research is slightly higher. It's pretty static still, hovering around the one mark, but it is higher than what you see in Mexico, and indeed, I'll show you later what you see in Brazil. So just a, an interesting uh, observation there. Turning to the open access landscape in Argentina, much of this is driven by MINCIT, which is the Ministry of Science, Technology and Innovation. They've really taken the lead role in promoting open access in Argentina and they fund a repository network called La Referencia, which I'll talk a bit in a bit more detail about shortly. In 2009, uh, Argentina developed a national system of science and technology digital repositories. They've also set up an expert committee to promote this and to promote a network of repositories. And in 2013, this was really um, backed by legislation. The legislation requires that all publicly funded research is made available in open access, interoperable institutional repositories. These can be individual or collaborative, but nevertheless, again, that sense of keep building up those institutional repositories for access is a key theme there. Deposit within those uh, institutional repositories, it's deposit after six months, which on first look for many publishers looks quite difficult, but actually it's not an access requirement uh, of six months. It's simply the author self-archiving must take place within six months. The embargo period for access can be variable following on from that. 
I think the uh, La Referencia network, again, which I'll talk about shortly, but also in general, the way in which there's been a real focus on driving institutional and national repository build-up is reflective of the fact that in Argentina, much of the open access activity is driven by institutions. Uh, they often issue their own resolutions on open access, although these aren't, don't, aren't typically binding, and indeed are uh, organising events around open access too. And finally, uh, one other thing to mention about the act open access activity in, in Argentina is Latindex, which is an abstracting and indexing database for Spanish and Portuguese open access journals, and that originated in Argentina. Oh, sorry, we're, this is a different slide deck to the one I've got here. We're missing a slide on La Referencia. Have you got the right deck? No, okay. Um, sorry, never mind. Uh, I wanted to just talk about La Referencia in greater detail. I mentioned here that it uh, began life in Argentina. Um, it was really pushed there, and it's a network that's established by Red Clara. Every government agency in a Latin American country is, in, in theory, supposed to contribute to it and put money towards it. So you'll see in Brazil, IBICT is the Brazilian agency that's linked up to La Referencia. And it's also done on an institutional basis. So institutions in each country will have a look at what their authors have published, link up with their national repository, try and make some connection with the La Referencia Pan American Initiative and make articles open access that way. It, its success is variable, um, but in terms of its member organizations in theory, you have Argentina, Brazil, Chile, Colombia, Ecuador, Mexico, Peru, and Venezuela, who are all members of La Referencia. And now on to Brazil. Um, obviously, you'll see here the uh, expenditure on R&D is far in excess of anything that Mexico or Argentina spend, and that, that's not surprising. Um, again, we've got that incremental increase since 2009 from $20 billion to just over $30 billion, which is actually quite close to the amount that's spent in the UK on R&D. <laughs> And again here, you see the number of publications by authors in Brazil has steadily increased year on year, although the rate of increase, again, with the red line, has, has started to drop slightly. Uh, but a l very large number of articles coming out of Brazil, around 270,500 articles were published between 2009 and 2013. But interestingly, out of uh, the three countries that I'm focusing on, Brazil's citation impact is the lowest of all three. Despite spending the most on R&D, publishing the most articles, its citation impact is, is below one and that has actually declined recently. And I realise that it's quite a lot of uh, information that I've gone through in, in terms of those three countries, so I thought it would just be pertinent to pause and do a comparison slide. You'll see here Mexico, Argentina and Brazil. I've shown here the article publication levels. You'll see that Argentina in the middle is slightly below Mexico and Brazil is way up there. But in terms of the citation impact of that research, uh, Brazil's remains the lowest on the scale, and it's only really in Argentina that we get about the world average of one. When thinking about some of the reasons as to why Brazilian research may have a lower impact than counterparts in Mexico and Argentina, I was thinking about international collaboration. Some of you may be aware that Elsevier did a, a report with the Department for Business Innovation and Skills last year um, looking at research trends, and one of the very clear trends that came out of that report was the increase in international collaboration and the impact that that's having on the impact of research. And you'll see here that in these three countries, international collaboration is, is pretty static. Uh, in Brazil, it's actually lower than in Argentina and Mexico. And I'm not suggesting that that is the sole or even a reason why um, Brazil's citation impact is lower, but I just thought I'd put it in there as, as food for thought because it's something that struck me as I was going through my notes. So turning to the open access landscape in Brazil, uh, Brazil is, is one of the most active countries in the region when it comes to open access, although even though it was the first country to introduce an open access bill in, in 2007, that hasn't actually passed yet. Um, it was similar to Mexico in that it was born with uh, an immediate deposit provision in there, but that has now been changed after discussion with the Senate and others. The rapporteur has introduced a variable embargo period, not just by discipline, but by journal as well, which is an interesting approach and one which open access advocates seem to be quite comfortable with, which is also interesting. 
Much of the open access activity is also driven by CNPQ, that's the National Research Council, part of the Ministry of Science and Technology, and they have a program to expand open access to research. They give priority funding to outputs that are published on an open access basis. And they work quite closely with CAPES, which I'll talk in a bit more detail about on the next slide. CAPES sits within the Brazilian Ministry of Education and is responsible for higher education policy, but it also wears a number of hats. It acts as a funding agency and as a consortium, and through those roles does a lot to drive open access in Brazil. Just very quickly, Cielo, which again I'll talk about on a, a later slide, so I'll, I'll pause on that. But Creative Commons Brazil, I thought it was interesting that of the three countries that I was mentioning, yes, there is an interest in and an awareness of Creative Commons licenses, but in Brazil in particular, they're actually working with a law firm in Rio de Janeiro to look at jurisdiction-specific licenses for Brazil and possibly for Latin America across the piece. And it will be really interesting to see how they feel uh, Creative Commons licenses should look differently for that, for that region as opposed to what's used globally. So turning to CAPES, I mentioned it's part of the Ministry of Education and wears a number of different hats as a consortium and as a funding body. Uh, business models aren't my thing at Elsevier. I'm much more focused on the policy, but I thought it would be interesting for some of you in the audience to see some of the partnerships that we've got going on in Brazil. And one is with CAPES. Uh, since 2009, Elsevier has maintained an open archive system on behalf of CAPES, and we provide access to Brazilian research in over 160 of our journals. That's about, roughly about 800 articles are made freely available after an embargo period. Recently, CAPES has uh, indicated that it wants to create its own repository um, and, and wants to really take ownership of a new repository. Uh, it remains to be seen how that repository will develop. Um, we're not members of it, and I'm not aware of that many publishers who are, but worth noting that it's an ambition of CAPES to create another repository there. And to Cielo, uh, the Scientific Electronic Library Online. It began life in Brazil, but it's actually got a much broader reach than Brazil now. And it was started as, an, as a way in which Brazilian publishers could publish open access art, uh, journals, primarily in Portuguese. Uh, but the spread of, of Cielo is much broader. It's even in some Portuguese countries in Africa. And it has ambitions, therefore, as many journals to be published on that platform as you would expect. In terms of Elsevier's in, uh, involvement, we publish uh, 15 journals on behalf of learned societies, several, several in multiple languages, and those are made available um, on Cielo. It's a different slide deck. Okay, the last slide I was going to put up was uh, on Chorus. And for those of you who are not aware, Chorus is the clearinghouse for open research in the US. And you may be wondering why I would want to be talking about Chorus in the US in a presentation about Latin America. And one of the reasons why is so I want to leave you with some food for thought that hopefully I've conveyed that there is a breadth of activity in Latin America, much of which is focused on building repositories. That's at institutional level, national level, and pan Latin America. Um, one can make their own uh, assumptions as to whether there is some inevitable duplication of effort there and how much more we can do to streamline the process of open access, certainly on a, a green open access basis. And Chorus is a, an, an initiative in the US. It's seeing publishers partner with uh, funding agencies, most recently the Department of Energy, so that when authors self-archive their work, that can be surfaced and made available through Chorus without having to deposit in a repository or for the repository to do anything extra. It links up to Chorus and either the accepted manuscript or the best available version of the article is surfaced to that end. And just when thinking about efficiencies and success of green open access policies, I just wanted to touch on Chorus. And I know that, that uh, colleagues from Chorus are here and if anybody has um, further questions, I'm sure they'll be very happy to, to answer them. That's what we mean. Thank you very much indeed, Gemma. That was terrific. Hi, uh, Robin Dunford, Dunford Consulting. Um, the lower impact of Brazilian research, do you think that's uh, partly a factor of just simply the fact that a lot of that is published in Portuguese, where there are not such a large corpus of Portuguese speakers around the world and not such a large amount of Portuguese literature out there compared to Spanish? I... I think that's certainly one of the reasons that I've heard been given, um, and that trade-off is, is sort of uh, acknowledged by Capes and Cielo in discussions that 
I know we've had with them where their focus is on why they're doing much to promote open access, say, for example, through Cielo, but it's not having that impact difference that they would have expected, and that is probably one of the reasons, yes.